This is the kind of phenomenologically based account of how we think about the organization of information in long-term memory. And similar to the story of the modal model, this is again, a kind of phenomenologically driven, not neuroscience based account of what's going on in, in how synaptic changes support long-term memory. And essentially it's, it's divided according to this kind of uh, explicit versus implicit, conscious versus subconscious. Uh, again, we associate consciousness with uh, the activity of neurons in the higher levels of the cortex. It's not great to think about basing an entire taxonomy of memory around something as subjective as consciousness. But if we translate that into the way we know uh, in terms of neural systems, we can kind of bypass the specific criteria of conscious access, which is again, phenomenologically very important, but from a kind of more objective science perspective, it might be better to organize things in terms of underlying kind of uh, neural mechanisms. And so we can just kind of translate this to say, this is memory that depends on those higher level parts of the brain. And in particular, we see here episodic memory, which again, we know is associated with the hippocampus at the very highest level of the cortical hierarchy. And then semantic memory, which is really associated with those uh, representations in the higher levels of the temporal lobe is essentially this ability to know about different facts uh, about the world. And so essentially this is like uh, your, your temporal lobe memory systems uh, are these explicit memory uh, wing of your long-term memory. And then you have this other entire big category of implicit memories. And again, in the traditional definition, this is a phenomenologically defined in terms of whether you're subjectively aware of it. But uh, we can also see that these are different brain systems that are gonna be supporting things like procedural memory. So that is gonna depend on the cerebellum, uh, your, your parietal lobe, which we're not too uh, consciously aware of, basal ganglia uh, for making those kinds of decisions about what to do. And then there's a whole category of priming. And priming is just this kind of residual effect of small synaptic changes in terms of how we understand it in the brain. But behaviorally, it's just like you get a little bit faster, you're more likely to produce certain kinds of responses, but it's not like an explicit thing that you're kind of consciously aware of. And so that's why it fits over here in this implicit memory bin, even though from a neural perspective, it actually is uh, often kind of affecting the, the synapses in this same part of the system. And so there you kind of think, well, it's just a, a question of like how strong those changes were. And anyway, so it's it's not the best uh, way. It's not how I would organize uh, our understanding of long-term memory, just based on the fact that it's not great to think about consciousness uh, that doesn't really apply as we saw to directly to understanding how animal memory might be organized. But we can translate this into uh, the, the neural substrates as we've talked about and that, that ends up being a little bit more actionable in terms of uh, applying it across different species. So uh, here again, the, the explicit consciously accessible uh, declarative systems are the hippocampus and surrounding uh, temporal lobe, generally speaking areas. We have this kind of pointing here, but it's, it's really about you know, all those kind of semantic knowledge representations, verbal, typically, and that's what makes it explicit or declarative. Declarative just refers to your ability to verbally describe the, the contents of memory. So that's, that's really all this kind of high level uh, knowledge, as we said, and high level association parts of cortex. And then all these implicit things involve things like the cerebellum, uh, the basal ganglia, and, and priming, again, is all those different uh, pathways uh, being sort of slightly tweaked. And so it sort of happens everywhere. Uh, it's a very pervasive effect. It isn't really localized to a particular brain area per se. So now let's try to understand more about what's going on in these episodic memory system here. So the hippocampal episodic memory system uh, is again, as we've said many times at the top of this overall cortical hierarchy. So here we have the parietal cortex dorsal stream the ventral cortex IT stream coming all the way up from V1, compressing all the information, 
as it goes up, extracting behaviorally relevant kind of dimensions, et cetera. And uh, this process continues in these medial temporal lobe kind of, you know, again, right here in the inner medial part of your temporal lobe is where these systems are. Um, you have separable areas called the parahippocampal cortex and the perirhinal cortex. Uh, it's generally thought that parahippocampal receives from the more from the dorsal stream, perirhinal more from the ventral stream. It's probably more mixed than this uh, simple story, uh, current data is suggesting. Those areas feed into the entorhinal cortex. And again, the rhinal aspect of this refers to the fact that ol olfactory kind of rhinal nose kind of cortex is nearby these areas, but these are not specifically olfactory brain systems. Um, and so then the, the entorhinal is the input output uh, pathway to the hippocampal formation, the hippocampus proper, as it's referred to, which is this set of areas here known as the dentate gyrus, the CA3, and the CA1. There's actually also a kind of subcortical equivalent of the entorhinal cortex known as the subiculum, the subiculum, nicely subcortical subiculum. Um, and, and so but we'll mainly focus on the cortical pathway here, the entorhinal cortex. So the overall idea is that you get this kind of continued compression of signals coming forward, coming up here, feed forward into the entorhinal cortex, such that the entorhinal cortex represents a very, very compressed, you know, iconic kind of uh, snapshot of everything that's happening out there in the rest of the brain across your entire posterior cortex. And then uh, the hippocampus itself takes a snapshot of that little kind of image of the rest of what's happening in your brain and encodes it critically in the synapses into the dentate gyrus from the dentate gyrus into the ca3 into the you know all these synapses here in blue are are changed to encode uh the the memory and most importantly you have a set of connections that that connect uh recurrently you know bidirectionally among cells in the CA3 itself and between the CA3 and the CA1. And these pathways are the critical synaptic pathways for encoding new memories, uh, kind of gluing together all the different elements of the, the picture that you have kind of encoded here from entorhinal cortex. And, uh, and the dentate gyrus plays this really important role, and we'll see this in a second, of really trying to separate out the patterns of activity so that when they're encoded up here in CA3, the information is really separate from each other for each distinct memory, and that keeping the memory separated really helps you encode that information without suffering from a lot of interference. That's really what we think the hippocampus is specialized for, is encoding things quickly without suffering from a lot of interference that you would otherwise get. So these synaptic changes in CA3 and CA1 enable the hippocampus to encode the new memory such that when the information shows up again, some cue here in entorhinal cortex that uh, fits a little bit with some of the elements from the previous memory, that cue is enough to trigger what we call pattern completion, this ability to retrieve the original full kind of episodic memory of all the details of a particular event. And then critically, the CA1 seems to be really important for being able to take that information that is retrieved initially in CA3 and sort of replay it back out into the rest of the cortex. And so this memory retrieval pathway that we're highlighting here in red is this essential uh, top-down activation of the full original episodic memory, the full combination of what and where information that you had previously encoded, who, what, where, when, all the facts uh, and elements of a particular episode. If you remember from our modal model of memory, this encoding process is taking activity patterns in short-term memory in these higher level association areas and essentially translating those or driving synaptic changes 
to encode this information into changes in, synaps in synapses that are long lasting and that support this kind of long-term memory process. And then the process of retrieval, this dynamic of retrieval is about taking some kind of cue that, that causes you to remember the full episodic information and then being able to reactivate or retrieve that full uh, pattern of activity. So if I ask you, you know, what did you have for dinner last night? That cue kind of comes up, activates, oh, dinner, last night, food, time, context, all these different features that might, might be present that you might have encoded and that drive this ability to kind of get back to that originally encoded pattern of synaptic changes that encoded, oh yeah, last night I had pizza for dinner. Uh, and then boom, pizza comes kind of coming back out of this pattern completion process, filling in the blank, essentially, like if you think about a fill in the blank kind of question, that's really what the hippocampus is doing is essentially filling in the blanks uh, from a retrieval probe and then sending that new information, pizza, back out into your cortex. And now you can say pizza because neurons have been reactivated uh, in these areas and you, you can kind of use that to drive behavior.